I previously considered an argument according to which an indeterministic notion of free will is incoherent because it would be no better than random chance or luck. I objected that this argument either depends upon a false dichotomy or else it waters down the notion of randomness so far that the argument no longer has any bite. But while it might be true that there is nothing logically problematic about the sort of indeterministic account of free will which I am espousing, perhaps the determinist will argue that it has nevertheless been shown to be false by new developments in neuroscience. As Dirk Paraboom says, a case can now be made for the claim, no objections canvassed so far, show that agent causal libertarianism is incoherent, at least in the sense that it involves no detected logical inconsistency. But this does not mean that it is in the clear. The request for more explanation of what agent causation is like can be regarded as part of an assessment of whether we have any reason to believe that agent causation exists, even if it is coherent. Accordingly, there are other ways in which one might attempt to undermine the hypothesis of agent causation. In my view, the most promising strategy would aim to show that although irreducible causal relations could, in principle, obtain between libertarian agent causes and events, in actual fact, there are empirical considerations that tell against this position. An often cited argument against indeterministic free will comes from a type of experiment first conducted by Benjamin Libet in 1983, with the results being duplicated in subsequent experiments. In these experiments, participants were told to move their wrist up when instructed to do so. Their brain activity was measured, and scientists could observe that there was a buildup of energy in the brain, what's referred to as readiness potential, several hundred milliseconds before the individuals became aware of their decision to move. This has been interpreted by many as evidence that the decisions which we make have already been decided prior to the time at which we make a conscious choice. As Robert Sapolsky concludes in a recent book on the subject, Collectively, what does this Libetian literature, starting with Libet, show? That we can have an illusory sense of agency, where our sense of freely, consciously choosing to act can be disconnected from reality. We can be manipulated as to when we feel a sense of conscious control. Most of all, this sense of agency comes after the brain has already committed to an action. Free will is a myth. But do these findings actually challenge the idea that we have free will? In fact, their significance has been greatly oversold, and the results do not even challenge the idea that we have free will, let alone refute it. Alfred Miele has been a staunch critic of attempts to use the Libet experiments to disprove free will. He documents no less than five serious problems with making the leap to the conclusion that our decisions are determined from the results of these experiments. As such, I will be quoting heavily from his work on the subject. The first problem with using Labette's findings as an argument against free will is that this ignores the fact that the subjects of these experiments retained the ability to reject the decision to act even after the readiness potential was achieved. In other words, even after the decision was supposedly made, the subjects of these experiments were able to refrain from acting. Indeed, it was on the basis of this fact that Benjamin Labette himself did not conclude that his experiments proved determinism. As Millet rightly says, Libet believed that once we become aware of our decisions or intentions to do something right away, we have about a tenth of a second to veto them. He thought free will might play a role in vetoing. As someone put it, Libet believed that although we don't have free will, we do have free won't. Second and more seriously, this argument assumes that the energy buildup is itself identical to the decision which is made, but there is no reason whatsoever to grant that assumption. It is entirely possible that the readiness potential in the brain is simply what the brain does when an agent is preparing to make a conscious decision. The readiness potential need not be conceived of as being identical to the decision which is made. As Mille asks, but are decision and intention the most suitable mental items to associate with readiness potential onset? Again, 
Labette describes the relevant occurrence of which the agent later becomes aware, not only as a decision and the onset of an intention to move, but also as the onset of an urge, wanting, and a wish to move. This leaves it open that at negative 550 milliseconds, rather than acquiring an intention or making a decision of which he is not conscious, the agent instead acquires an urge or desire of which he is not conscious, and perhaps an urge or desire that is stronger than any competing urge or desire at the time, a preponderant urge or desire. It is also left open that what emerges around negative 550 milliseconds is a pretty reliable causal contributor to an urge. I believe that if Libet himself were to distinguish between intending and wanting, including having an urge, along the lines I sketched, he might find it more credible to associate the readiness potentials with the latter than with the former. Elsewhere he says, Why should we think that a decision is made when the EEG rise begins? Maybe what's going on in the brain when the rise begins is a process that might, or might not, lead to a decision a bit later. And he goes on to conclude, The assertion that a process is initiated does not entail that it will be completed. This is a point to bear in mind. Libet himself appeals to grounds for believing that an act-now process that is initiated unconsciously may be aborted by the agent and therefore not be completed. That, apparently, is what happens in instances of spontaneous vetoing if act-now processes start when Libet says they do. Third, the experiments fail to acknowledge that there is room for free will to play a role between the readiness potential onset and the bodily movement. As Mille observes, processes have parts, and the various parts of a process may have more and less proximal initiators. A process that is initiated by an item in the pre-proximal intention group may have a subsequent part that is directly initiated by a consciously made decision. The conscious self, which need not be understood as something mysterious, might more proximately initiate a voluntary act that is less proximally initiated by an item in the pre-proximal intention group. The point to be noticed here is that from the datum that some neural events leading up to the movement begin before a conscious proximal intention emerges, one cannot legitimately infer that any of the following play no role in producing the movement. The acquisition of the proximal intention, the agent's consciousness of the intention, or the physical correlates of either of these items. Fourth, these experiments do not even establish that there is a general correlation between readiness potential and decisions because the readiness potential was only recorded when a bodily movement was made. But for all we know, the brain could just be constantly having these sorts of energy buildups even when decisions are not being made. The bottom line is that we do not currently have enough information even to conclude that readiness potential is regularly correlated with decision making, let alone that the two are identical or that one causes the other. Again, Mille says, Labette's experiments used a signal to tell a computer to make a record of the preceding couple of seconds of electrical activity. The signal Labette used was the muscle burst. So we don't know whether sometimes, even though the person didn't go on to flex, there was brain activity, like what was going on in the participants a half second before they flexed. If we want to find out whether brain activity at a certain time is well correlated with an action at a later time, we need to try to find out whether that brain activity sometimes happens and no corresponding action follows it. Why Bet didn't look for this. Because of his setup, records of electrical activity were made only when there was a muscle motion. For all we know, on some occasions, maybe many, there was a rise and no associated flexing action. Fifth and finally, there is a hasty generalization from the sorts of decisions studied in these experiments to all other human decisions. But such an inference is premature because there are important and relevant differences between the sorts of decisions which were being made during the Libet experiments and the decisions which we make in everyday life. Specifically, the test subjects were told to act instantly and without forethought. 
there were no reasons to make the choices which they made, and no rewards or punishments to motivate one choice over another. They were essentially just making decisions at random. But that's clearly unlike the sorts of decisions which we care about having control over in our everyday lives. The test subjects in Libet's experiments were encouraged to be random and not deliberate in their choices. As Mille contends, As a participant in Libet's experiment, you would arbitrarily pick a moment to begin flexing in order to comply with part of your instructions. There's no need at all for conscious reasoning about what to do. But in real-life situations in which we do reason consciously about what to do, the road to action seems quite different. It often seems a lot less arbitrary. If we want to know whether conscious reasoning ever plays a role in producing decisions, we shouldn't restrict our attention to situations in which people are instructed not to think about what to do. So there we have five serious problems facing the idea that Libet's experiments have disproved the existence of free will. Collectively, they demonstrate that it is time to leave these sorts of arguments against free will behind. Mille concludes the matter well, saying, Does the brain decide to initiate actions at a time before there is any reportable subjective awareness that such a decision has taken place? Libet and his colleagues certainly have not shown that it does, for their data do not show that any such decision has been made before time W, or before the time at which their subjects first are aware of a decision or intention to flex. Nothing justifies the claim that what a subject becomes aware of at time W is a decision to flex that has already been made, or an intention to flex that has already been acquired, as opposed, for example, to an urge to flex that has already arisen. Indeed, the data about vetoing, as I have explained, can reasonably be used to argue that the urge hypothesis about what the readiness potentials indicate is less implausible than the decision or intention hypothesis. Now, there have been similar, more recent experiments conducted since the time of Libet, which have also been claimed to undermine the idea that we have free will. In particular, a 2008 study involving fMRI scans of the brain which showed that decisions of the participants could be predicted up to 10 seconds in advance, has been touted about as evidence against the reality of free will. But in addition to these predictions being about only 60% accurate, Alfred Miele points out that the conclusions drawn from these experiments suffer from many of the same deficiencies as those drawn from Libet's. The main problems with Libet's version of the argument apply here as well. First, there is no good reason to believe that the early brain activity the scientists detected is correlated with an early decision. Second, spontaneous picking of a button or moment to press is so different from decisions that seem to flow from a careful weighing of pros and cons that it's a serious mistake to generalize from the alleged findings to all decisions. What happens in scenarios featuring spontaneous picking may be very different from what happens in scenarios in which we spend a lot of time and effort weighing pros and cons before we decide what to do. It is, in fact, highly dubious that scientific inquiry will ever be able to settle the question of free will. In order to prove that the brain could cause bodily movements without conscious intention, one would need to achieve the same bodily movements while blocking an intention from forming but it seems unlikely that we will ever be able to ensure that condition. As such, those who go looking to neuroscience to settle the question of free will are, in my opinion, just barking up the wrong tree. As Richard Swinburne concludes, to show that an intention was irrelevant, a scientist would need to show that a particular kind of brain event causes the very same sequence of brain events with or without subjects having the requisite intention to produce that bodily movement, and so with or without the bodily movement constituting an intentional action. It would only be possible to perform such an experiment to show this if scientists could prevent the occurrence of intention without thereby automatically preventing the sequence of brain events caused by the particular kind of brain event. That could only be done if either the intention is not caused by any brain event whatsoever, or it is caused by a brain event, which is not part of the sequence. 
For only if intention is not caused by an event which belongs to the sequence could the intention be prevented without preventing the occurrence of the sequence of events which caused the bodily movement. As far as I know, no one has attempted to show this.